Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. I'm Ernie Armstrong, and it's my privilege to lead in Bible study this morning from Colonial Hill. We are continuing to walk through in our Sunday School lessons the Gospel of Luke. Uh, today's lesson will be taken from the ninth chapter. Uh, frankly, it's one of the more well-known uh, passages in, in uh, Luke's gospel and, and uh, in Matthew's gospel as well. Uh, the New International Version, which is the version of uh, uh, or the translation that I most often read from, has subtitles for the sections uh, throughout the chapters, and this one is entitled Peter's Confession of Christ. <clears throat> now, the lesson, or, or the verses, verses 18 through 27, actually deal with some of Jesus' teaching in response to Peter's confession of Christ. And that's what we're going to look at, Peter's confession, but most importantly, Jesus' teaching. Uh, I want to begin at the end uh, because the last verse, verse 27, in this section, it is a part of a discourse or uh, a response or, or teaching from Jesus, uh, but for many it seems uh, to be different and it doesn't fit into the neat uh, study category of verses 18 through 26. So what is verse 27? Let's, let's discuss it because I think it's important and it raises some questions sometimes and to some extent our lesson today is about questions. So let, let's look. Uh, let me read verse 27. I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. So one of the questions is, was Jesus wrong about that? Or who didn't taste death before they see the kingdom of God? Generally, the, the thought is uh, something similar to uh, some of Peter's, I'm sorry, Paul's letters uh, that suggested Christ would return before, uh, while some of the believers were still living. But that's not what Jesus is, is saying. He says, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. And what's really important, or so I read from some of the other uh, material that I, I look at, to understand that particular verse, we need to, to read and understand the verses that follow. But the verses that follow are not a part of our lesson today. So let me just touch on that real, real quickly and then come back to our lesson. What follows? Both uh, <clears throat> in Luke's account as well as Matthew, and I didn't look at Mark, but I believe Mark as well. What follows that statement, some of you who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. What follows is the uh, transfiguration. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, with Peter, John, and James. And they see uh, two men, Moses and Elijah, uh, appear in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. And Jesus is transfigured uh, right in front of them, right before their eyes. And thus it's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And so the idea is that Jesus is not telling them, the disciples, that some of you will still be alive before, or will not die before you see the kingdom of God. He's not saying you will still be alive when I return. He is saying you will see the kingdom of God before you die. And just almost immediately, well, eight days thereafter, Jesus took Peter, James, and John upon the mount. He said, some of you. And they saw Jesus, they saw Moses, they saw Elijah in glorious splendor. They saw what the kingdom of God is uh, like for uh, 
uh, for them or what it's to be like. So that said, let's go back to verse 18 and study today's lesson, verses 18 through, I'm now going to say verse 26. Um, And there are some extremely important questions, maybe the most important questions uh, that, is, that are posed to a Christian, and they will be posed, uh, especially the first one. So let's look and see. Once, upon a, uh, once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him. Sorry, I lost my place. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, What do the crowds, who do the crowds say I am? As I say, probably the most important question that any of us will be faced with, and we will all be faced with this question. It's easy for me to answer uh, the question that's really posed in verse 19. He asked the question of them, in verse 18, who do the crowds say I am? And so I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, interesting, I think it's interesting. Uh, earlier in chapter 9, Herod essentially asks or tells the answer to that same question. Verse 7, now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on. All that's going on is the miracles that Jesus uh, has been performing. Um And he, Herod the Tetrarch, was perplexed because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come back to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? Such things as all of the miracles and teaching of Jesus. And he tried to see him. All right. Jesus asks his apostles, his disciples. He has been praying. It says privately. And then it says, but his disciples were with him. So what does it mean he was praying privately? In all likelihood, it means he is away from the crowds that have been following him everywhere, seeking to see a miracle or to hear his, his teaching and preaching. And so he is with them, and he is praying privately. His disciples are with him. And he asks them, who do the crowds say I am? Verse 19, they replied, uh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. Now, that's exactly what Herod had heard. It's almost as if he's been talking to the disciples. He hadn't. He's been talking to the crowds. And Jesus asked his disciples, who do the crowds say I am? And they responded the same way as those who responded to uh, Herod did. Could be John the Baptist. Could be Elijah. Maybe it's just one of the prophets of old come back to life. Now, all of those are important. Uh, John the Baptist and Elijah uh, have much in common. In fact, Jesus uh, has said or says that John the Baptist uh, is, in fact, the Elijah. The Jews thought Elijah would come back before the Messiah. And so John the Baptist is, in essence, uh, standing in the stead of, in the place of, Elijah. And uh, because he is a miracle worker, because he teaches and preaches God, uh, he may be a prophet, thinks some of these, uh, some of these people. But Jesus goes on in verse 20. But what about you? Who do you say I am? And it's verse 20 that I've been talking about um, in saying the most important question. Not only is it the most important question, it is a question that all of us will be asked at some point in time. Our eternity is determined by our answer. 
the second part of verse 20, Peter answered, the Christ, the Christ of God. Some translations, this is New International, some translations say God's Messiah. Uh, so who is the Messiah or what is the Messiah? Most of you already know the answer to that. Uh, the Messiah means anointed one. Um, and in the Old Testament in particular, God anointed priests, prophets, and kings. In our own, almost in our own time, in 1953, for those of you who watch the, or have watched The Crown and have gotten far enough uh, into the episodes, um, know that Queen Elizabeth, who is still on the throne, was coronated in 1953, and that service, that coronation, was televised. Amazing for 1953. But her anointing was not televised. The Archbishop of Canterbury anointed her and uh, said these words as he anointed her with the sacred oil. Be thy head anointed with holy oil, as kings, priests, and prophets were anointed, and as Solomon was anointed king by Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet. So be you anointed, blessed and consecrated queen over the peoples, whom the Lord thy God hath given thee to rule and govern. So when Peter says Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, he is saying something very similar to what the, to what the Archbishop of Canterbury was saying uh, over uh, Queen Elizabeth. So except he is saying you are the chosen one of God to rule and govern his people and all people. So, Good news, great news. Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't that the conclusion we ought to come to? Jesus is the Messiah, says Peter. So is there a problem? And what is the problem? Well, the Jewish people are under Roman rule, and they have it in their minds that the Messiah will be a military leader who will defeat the Romans, throw them out, and reestablish the uh, glorious kingdom of David. Um, they thought he would be a conqueror, a military leader. Well, to some extent, Jesus is a military leader, but his fight is not against Rome. He is leading the fight against sin and death that results from sin. For all, Paul says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, says Paul, is death. Um, but Jesus commands his disciples uh, not to tell who he is because his battle is not against the Roman government. It is against sin. And he doesn't want the idea of the simple answer that Peter gave, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, uh, in, uh, uh, I believe it's Matthew's uh, version. Uh, so we ask, the, so if he is not that Messiah, and Jesus doesn't want the people to get the idea right now that he is the Messiah because they will rush to try to uh, lead him into, direct him into, pressure him into being what they think the Messiah is to be, a deliverer, a military conqueror. So if Jesus is not the military conqueror and he tells his people, do not tell anybody, he's strict, uh, verse 21 says, uh, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, that this is Peter's answer, you are God's Messiah. Um, because even the disciples are not ready for that truth. Um, 
All right. So Peter says Jesus is the Messiah, but not the Messiah the people are thinking of in all likelihood. Um, so who is the Messiah, or what is the Messiah? Um, to understand who Jesus is as the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, we need to understand why he came. If we're struggling with understanding who Jesus is, even if we have the intellectual knowledge that uh, he is the Messiah, what does that mean? Well, let's look to see what Jesus himself says that he came to do. Uh, and in, in saying this, just like we sometimes do, maybe certainly not as well, Jesus uh, may be linking his identity as Messiah to his mission. Uh, we do the same thing. We say, I'm a lawyer. Uh, that is my identity. I received uh, my COVID vaccination Thursday, and there in the uh, waiting room after to be observed after getting the uh, vaccination, uh, a sweet, sweet lady who is more has more years than I uh, said, looked at me and said, "Are you a lawyer?" which I thought was extremely interested, interesting uh, because to a large extent, that's my identity, my identity. So how would Jesus answer if he is tying his identity to what he does, what he came for? Uh, would he say, I'm a son, I'm a savior? A savior? Uh, if his identity is linked to what he came to do, what is it that he came, came to do? Let's look at verse 22. And he said, so Jesus is responding after warning them not to tell anyone that he is the Messiah. He says, the Son of Man, his favorite in Luke's account, uh, gospel anyway, a, a reference to himself. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Um uh, so this is what he came uh, to do. Uh, there's nothing in what he tells us there, or tells his disciples, about him coming to gain military or political or social power or economic power. He didn't come in order to uh, uh, build up riches and wealth. He didn't come to provide us with neighbors that we like, although there's a better chance that we'll like them if they are Christians. And so, by the way, that's a more incentive to let them know what it means to know who Jesus is. Um, Jesus didn't say, I've come to live a long, healthy life. He didn't say that's what, he didn't come for the purpose of saying that we are to live a long, healthy life. So what is it again that he came to do? Well, he came to suffer, to be rejected, to die, and then to rise again. This is the first reference, certainly in Luke's gospel, where Jesus is telling his followers that he is going to die. Uh, but first he says uh, in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Not, I'm likely to, it's a possibility. He said, I must suffer. And certainly he's probably talking about uh, his arrest, his trial, the flogging, the physical pain, the crucifixion, uh, but also almost certainly his suffering includes being rejected by the very people he came to save. The very ones who should have welcomed him with open arms, who should have known 
God's Messiah. They rejected him. And not only did they reject him, but they ultimately demanded that Pilate, the Roman uh, governor, crucify him. And then, as a result of that crucifixion, Jesus is going to die. And he does die. And if that's all that we know about Jesus, if that's where we stop in our learning about Jesus, then, as Paul would say, uh, we, uh, we have failed miserably. Uh, we're nothing more than fools to place our allegiance, our trust, our discipleship in Jesus if he just dies. And that's the end of the story of Jesus. But as Jesus tells his disciples right here, that's not the end. Jesus' body is not left on the cross. It's placed in a tomb that becomes empty because he rises from the grave. He doesn't stay dead. He lives and is alive today. And so one of the ways that you know if you're a Christian is if you believe in Jesus' death and resurrection and believe that as a result of that resurrection, he can save you from death too, then you can be and are a Christian. But Jesus has more words, and we need to look at more instructions. Uh, but let me not just leave those last words about believing in Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Because if you don't believe in that resurrection, if you don't know about it and you don't uh, believe in it, then let me join others and inviting you to do what Jesus was doing in verse 18. That is, pray, pray, pray that God would reveal to you who Jesus is for you. And I think God will do that if you pray for that. But once he reveals to you who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Anointed One of God, the Messiah, and what he came to do, the story doesn't stop there because as a result of all of this and our belief in him, our life should change, should be changed. And so we get to essentially the last question raised by the lesson. So what does all of this mean for me? Let's look at verses 23 through 27, and we've already looked at 27, so I'm going to stop at verse 26. Then he said to them, then he said to them all, and I underline the word all, whoever uh, wants to be my disciple, or I'm sorry, this uh, that's an older version of the, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit his very self? <clears throat> if he, and this is important, I believe, verse 26, all of it is important. But we need to look at verse 26 as well. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in, his, uh, and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So what does Jesus say in instructing us as to how our life would change and thus what his coming means to me. He first says in verse 24 uh, that we should, uh, I'm sorry, verse 23, he must deny himself 
If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. First, first idea is if you want to follow Jesus, and then he tells us what that entails. It entails that we deny ourselves. He must deny himself. Uh, so what does that mean? Deny here is the very same word that's used over in John's gospel, uh, talking about when Peter denied Jesus three times on the night of his trial, crucifixion, and death. Yes, Peter. Peter knew who Jesus was. He just told us Jesus is the Messiah. But when his own life was put at risk, and he might have to suffer along with Jesus right there, he denies him. This is not what Jesus is talking about when he says deny yourself. Because Peter denies Jesus, denies knowing him. How often do we, like Peter, deny Jesus when the going gets difficult? How often do we fail to speak up and tell a coworker or an acquaintance that we know Jesus? It was so devastating to Peter that Peter was on the verge of being lost. I don't mean salvation. I mean lost in his effectiveness for Jesus. And Jesus, after his resurrection on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, took Peter aside in John chapter 21 and, and really some of the most poignant of passages in the New Testament said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter answered, uh, Jesus asked him that question three times. And Peter answered each time, Lord, you know that I do. You know I love you. What Jesus was doing with Peter is walking him back through his own, deni <clears throat> his own denials, the three denials. But this time he's walking Peter in the right direction. And so with Jesus, Peter goes in the right direction. It hurt Peter, and it may hurt us to revisit those places where we've denied Jesus. But we all do at some point in time. And we may need to rewalk those same situations and have that talk again with the coworker. Let them know we know who Jesus is and what he wants of us. We are to deny ourselves. But we are also to pick up our cross daily. Um, verse 24, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Uh, we give up all of who and what we are in order to be a part of Jesus. That's difficult for some. That's more difficult for others. It's difficult for me. I find myself sometimes saying, I want my stuff. I want to do my things. Instead of asking Jesus, do you want me to do yours? And what is it you want me to do? And that's where picking up and carrying your cross daily uh, comes into play. Uh, Jesus is asking us or telling us we have to do what he did on the way to the cross. He carried the crossbar until he could no longer do it. The Romans made the crucified or the uh, convicted and to be crucified prisoners carry the, the cross beam to the place of crucifixion to just to remind them that they have already lost their lives, already forfeited it. 
And Jesus is saying, you've got to carry your cross each day. And so we need to ask each day, what is it you would have me do? How would you have me carry my cross today? Uh, today, the cross may be an easy burden. Next week, it may be a heavy burden. But Jesus is asking somewhat simply is for us to keep carrying that cross as he gives it to us and follow after him. And oh, by the way, he will assist us in carrying it so that we can follow him. And that's the last of it. Uh, verse 26, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Um, sometimes I think we try to make it sound too easy for somebody to be a Christian. And yes, uh, I think it's Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you uh, believe in your heart uh, and, and confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But Jesus says here, if you are ashamed of me, if you won't stand up and identify yourself as my follower, then I will be ashamed of you. Uh, I've, I think it's Matthew chapter 7, it might be Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 25-ish, uh, where some say, come to Jesus and say, Lord, Lord. And he says, I never knew you. Get away from me. The first step is knowing who Jesus is. The second step is understanding why he came and, what he, and thirdly, what he asks of us. He asks us to deny ourselves, carry whatever cross he gives us, and third, and as a, a part of that, to follow him, identify with him, accept him, tell others, I am a Christian, I believe in Jesus as my Savior. And so, who is Jesus? He is the Messiah. Why did he come? He came to suffer, to be rejected, to die, but to rise again, to save you and me from our sins. And... He wants us to be his and to follow him. A deep but great lesson from God's word. And so let me thank you for being with us and studying with us this morning. Won't you come worship with us here at Colonial Hill Baptist Church? We would love to have you as a part of our in-person worship. We'd love to worship with you. Thank you. Good morning.